You know, you can't go and find a dinosaur in Ontario, but you can find trilobites. We're going back about 450 million years. The Earth was a very, very different place uh, at that time. We probably wouldn't recognize it were we able to take a time machine and go back that far. The Craigley Dairy specifically has a, a unique deposit called the Collingwood Shale. And this is a black bituminous uh, oil shale. And it's just absolutely abundantly full of fossils, which makes it unique in and of itself. I have collected fossils all over Ontario and also in parts of the United States and even in the Middle East. And the Collingwood exposures are, are unique and, and valuable. You know, building into the social history of, of human occupation of this area, and of course these rocks themselves as holders of all of this organic material. Fossils. Um, the term fossil comes from the Latin word fossa, which means something like a hole in the ground. And it has come to mean the preserved remains of living things. By convention, we say anything older than 10,000 years is a fossil. Now we come to understand fossil, uh, word fossil, will describe basically any evidence of past life that is preserved in some kind of geological medium, typically in rocks, but it could be in loose sediments, it could be in ice, it could be in tar for that matter, but the remains of ancient plants and animals or a record of their activity. There are also other fossils that are called ichnofossils. These are not actually the bits and parts or bodies of animals, but the traces they left behind. So think in terms of worm burrows or trails in the mud, and they show more behavior plowing through the mud, scavenging for food. Unfortunately, something bad happened to them, they died. Their shell remains, but the soft, squishy parts have all decayed and rotted away. Now, there's different ways of becoming fossilized. When an object is buried, generally speaking, by that point, all the soft parts have decayed away through bacterial action and other actions. So what we're left with is the hard parts. Fossils we find are mostly in sedimentary rocks, and sedimentary rocks are those that are formed from sediments, um, such as sand or mud, and also include limestone. Most sedimentary rocks um, form at the bottoms of seas, and this is where we find most fossils on Earth, and this, um, the fossils of the Craigleith area, are from the bottom of ancient seas in sedimentary rock. Most animals that lived and died left no fossil record at all. So we're very lucky to be able to find any fossils at all in the grand scheme of things. The geologic time scale matches geological layers to chronological time. Because of this, we know that the Earth and the solar system are about 4.5 billion years old. The geological time scale is divided into four eons, and in the first three eons, there was mostly just unicellular life on Earth. In the first of those eons, there was no life on Earth, huge amounts of volcanism. The fourth eon starts only 541 million years ago, and the first period of that eon is the Paleozoic. 
The Ordovician period was the second period of the Paleozoic. It was preceded by the Cambrian, which was the first period, and it's in the Cambrian that animals with hard parts appear. During the Ordovician, particularly the later part of the Ordovician, we're looking at a time in Earth's history where life had very recently expanded in diversity, starting about 520 million years ago. A big boom. The first real animals appeared and um, expanded markedly. But during the Ordovician, there was a second explosion of life called the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event. A lot of the animal groups and plant groups that were established in the seas during the Cambrian really expanded and some more new ones appeared. So it was a, a vibrant time in the seas, but again, even the, the sea life would have been very, very different. There would have been no large fish, so there were no vertebrate predators in the sea at the time. The sea was dominated by invertebrate animals with their backbones. Lots of things were um, very unfamiliar in many respects. Um, there wasn't any exposed land surface very close to us here, so we were in this shallow epicontinental sea, a sea actually overlying the continent. It was much warmer back in the Ordovician period, the late Ordovician period, than it is now. Uh, sea surface temperatures were, were much, much higher in many places, so it was very warm. There wasn't actually much on the surface of the land at this point. There are no trees, there are no animals living permanently on land. There may have been some small primitive plants, some green algae, perhaps some liverwort-like things growing along moist shores, but the land surface was essentially barren, denuded. Craig Leith itself, uh, the shales were about 20 to 80 meters below sea level. Swimming in the seas would have been the cephalopods or nautiloids with their long conical shells and a squid-like animal. There would also have been clams and mussels, which are called polysopods, very much like we have today. There would have been many species of brachiopods, um, which were extraordinarily common during the Paleozoic. One of the most characteristic animals of Craig Leith is uh, the trilobite Pseudogygites. The thing about the trilobites here is that, although there are <laughs> millions and millions and millions of them as fossils, uh, despite the fact that there are so many trilobite remains, they're predominantly just one kind of trilobite, one species, and it's this thing called Pseudogygites latimarginatus. Trilobites are my favorite. I. I was always drawn to them. I always liked trilobites. To me, they're, for lack of a better word, they're ancient looking. These are things that are really unfamiliar and there are thousands of species of them. They occur throughout the whole world as well. And they have a long temporal range. They've been on, or they were on Earth from the early Cambrian and finally went extinct at the end of the Permian period, 350 million years or so. And just a, a huge variety of shapes and spines and sizes and and they had all sort of living habitats and, and when you see them with their antenna and gills and beautifully preserved with all the internal organs it's almost like they can walk right off the rock and you can see it's very very dark full of bitumen and various other organic material uh, they're called trilobites because they're divided into three segments tri meaning three, and three lobes, trilobites. There's the pygidium, which is the bottom. Think of it as the tail. Now these you'll see by the tens of thousands in the Collingwood Shale. There's the thorax and the cephalon. The cephalon's the head, and there are various other elements within each segment. These are the axial lobes. There's free cheeks and fixed cheeks, libragina, fixagina, and the glabella. These are all pieces of what we call exuvae from the trilobites throughout the Collingwood Shale. What would happen is as the trilobite grew, it would molt very much like arthropods do today, any insect or larger arthropods. The glabella would slide forward, the cephalon would crack up, and the trilobite would crawl out through the shell and continue to start growing and regrowing its shell.
shrimp, crab, lobster, the crustacean group, another huge group of animals that are alive today. Trilobites belong within that large group and they share the features of having those um, jointed limbs, um, an, an exoskeleton that is often mineralized, hardened in some way. We do know that because we find some trilobites in large numbers together as we do here with Pseudogegites, um, that they must have had a large, dense population at times. They lived, trilobites, when they were alive and functioning as animals in these ancient seas. There were lots of other things alive around them. Obviously, they needed a food source of some kind, and if they were scavengers or predators, they were looking for other things to, to eat. And occasionally, we do find these fossils of these large predatory cephalopod mollusks, the things that are related to modern squids, octopus, and, um, and nautilus. And it's as those as the predators of the sea may well have been consuming trilobites. Uh, in later geological periods, these things got huge. In the Georgian Bay Formation, they've got cephalopods 10 or 20 feet long. Here, they, they, they were quite large, but big enough to predate on just about any trilobite. And we suppose they do eat trilobites because we found evidence of healed wounds on trilobites. And these are a particular group of cephalopods called nautiloids which inhabited long conical straight shells. Cephalopods is a group that includes the modern octopus, the modern squid. So these are fascinating animals, as I say, predators um, that probably made it necessary for animals like trilobites, for example, to develop their habit of rolling up like the modern pill bug does. Brachiopods have got two valves, but often we call one side the dorsal valve and the other side the ventral valve. Now, when you look at them straight on, they are actually symmetrical. The right side looks just like the left side. Throughout the Paleozoic, brachiopods were extremely common fossils and then they suffered huge losses during the mass extinction at the end of the Paleozoic. The remains of a particular animal that we find in the Craigleaf area will be columnals of an animal called a crinoid. Crinoids are called sea lilies. They are animals and they're related to starfish they basically consist of a ring of tentacles that is used to scoop in plankton that sits on top of a long stalk or stem and then has a hold fast at the bottom. These are all hard parts, but when the animal dies, the membrane that's holding all these parts together disintegrates. So usually with crinoids, what we just find are bits of their exoskeleton. We often find these little discs, which are columnals, and if you look closely at those little discs, you'll often see a five-pointed star in them. Another fossil that you may find in the Craigleaf area are gastropods. Gastropod means stomach foot, and this refers to snails and also slugs. So we can find the fossils of snails, it will be a coiled structure. We often find just internal casts of snails. They're very obviously snails, but the shell isn't there. It's just the internal cast. Another fossil that we find at Craigleaf are called graptolites. They look like pencil scratches. Um, if you look at them with a magnifying glass, you can see they've got little cups. These are colonies of floating animals with one individual animal in each one of the little chambers. Now, these animals float in the plankton layer, and the plankton layer is a layer of mostly microscopic single-celled animals, single-celled plants, which float in the plankton layer. They're the basis of the food chain. Plankton's an extraordinarily part of the ecosystem, both in the past and nowadays. Craig Leith is unusual in having these conial areas. 
They are an animal which is quite rare um, in the fossil record and yet it lasted for about 230 million years. They basically look like a four-sided pyramid. To me it looks like stacks of popsicle sticks. These are rods of calcium phosphate. Sometimes we've had soft fossils of these and these indicate that they stood on the narrow end and at the wide end they had tentacles. The fact that we cannot interpret these very well shows how science is a continuing process. We're not even sure what they're related to. Our best guess so far is that they're related to jellyfish. Life was abundant here 450 million years ago. So it's a really unique snapshot of that time and place in Earth's history that we can have a fairly good look back in time and say, wow, look what was here. You know, and these things are still alive today. These things are long gone. There's still more to be found, more to be discovered, more to be interpreted from these rocks. The original description of these rocks and the original description of the trilobites from here back in the late 1800s, we've made great progress in understanding the history of the Earth, the history of the planet, the, the, the Ordovician period, the life of the Ordovician period. And that's only because we keep going back and looking at these rocks over and over and over again. New technologies, uh, a, new, a new understanding, a new perspective allow us to, allow, all of those things allow us to, to get more information back out of those rocks. The abundance of easily um, recognizable Pseudogygites in particular remains and those of other trilobites is something you won't find anywhere else that I've seen in Ontario. Because the shale is based on such fine-grained mud, it preserves details you won't see elsewhere. The Craigleaf shale in particular is a very unique snapshot in time. You know, and it, it shows us in very, very good detail what was going on here in what's now Southern Ontario a very, very long time ago. And I think we should take all means necessary to preserve some of the shale in situ so people can come and study it and look and learn. It's a great window into the past and a very rare one. I don't know anywhere else in Ontario, and I imagine there's very few places in the world where you will find such a great fossil resource that's useful for both scientists and general public. It's an ideal teaching resource. There are not many places where you can actually walk on fossil beds like these and see the, the remnants of this ancient sea community spread out before you. Because frankly, you know, we haven't written the book, the final book on this. 